what I wanted to talk about uh, today is uh, you know, graphs have arrived. They've truly arrived. And as Emil was, and as he was talking about uh, the various companies that have had this graph of epiphany, whether it's Google or LinkedIn, and if you think about those founders, you know, Reid Hoffman and Peter Thiel, they've taken that epiphany from one company to the other. It's the same epiphany that there is value in these data relationships. And they started with PayPal and took it to LinkedIn and now to Palantir. And I think there is uh, a tremendous value even today available from graph databases, regardless of uh, what industry you represent or what function you're managing. And uh, you know, we, have had a, we have a really uh, packed session today, lots of uh, practitioners who have brought examples from their real world experience to uh, demonstrate how they are getting value. And before I invite them here in this track, the business track, what I wanted to do was uh, briefly go over some of the typical use cases that we are seeing today. Now, you know, as, as being part of this world, we truly believe that the graph model is the most well-suited model for almost any type of application. And in future, we believe that that's going to be the default database of choice. But obviously, there is uh, a lot of investment in various technologies and skills behind those technologies. And so what organizations are doing is systematically prioritizing where they can find the most value from graph databases, and they're bringing value within those functions. Um, and the value we find is uh, in both categories of applications, you know, internal applications where the primary consumer of the application is your employee, and external applications where you are having customers and partners be the primary consumers. And, and increasingly, this line's blurring. So this categorization over time is going to disappear. But uh, the very first use case uh, in the internal application is in the world of uh, managing your master data. Now, you know, master data comes in all shapes and in all categories. It's uh, strictly speaking, we divide that into people or concepts or locations and things. And uh, you know, almost every organization has customers and suppliers and employees. And this is reference data. Uh, another example of, of master data on the thing side is you know, if you are selling a product or a service or uh, if you are managing devices, then that's another example of your reference data and uh, locations, as well as uh, if you have contracts or warranties for an insurance company and managing policies, that's also an example of master data. Now, you know, master data has always um, represented a lot of value to the organization. However, you know, year after year, the efforts to extract value from this data have failed. You know, we always heard about 360 view of the customer or single version of the truth or using the knowledge of data relationships in real time. However, the problem plaguing this is the underlying data store, which typically ends up being a relational database. And that's where, as you saw in Northwind, a lot of the value gets lost. And uh, that's the first area where we are finding a tremendous adoption of graph databases, whether you are managing your reference or master data as part of your own application, or you are consolidating that as uh, in a single repository, we are finding organizations are putting their employee hierarchy, their customer hierarchy, product hierarchy, even devices and networks inside a graph database, simply because that's the most natural way that this data occurs in the real world. And so putting that into the graph database is the most natural way for a business user and the IT, uh, their IT counterpart to think about this data. Uh, the biggest value then comes from being able to extract or retrieve this data in real time alongside all the data relationships. So that's one area that uh, we're finding a, a lot of uh, adoption uh, for graph databases. Uh, today we have sessions from uh, Pitney Bowes. They have uh, created a, a master data management solution that leverages uh, graph database as its uh, storage infrastructure uh, to extract this value. Um, the second area is uh, what we call uh, network and IT operations management. Just like your master data, if you're managing a network, if you're a telecommunications company and if you have network nodes, or 
you have a data center or an IT um, infrastructure that runs into thousands of machines and software applications and so on, it's typically a network. No single device or a machine operates in isolation. And uh, uh, configuration management databases have uh, been around for a while. Again, the infrastructure underneath that ends up being relational. And what we're seeing is a lot of organizations are now replacing that with the graph database because that makes it possible for them to troubleshoot the problems of their infrastructure in a pretty agile fashion. And not only that, they can also predict that if a certain cell tower were to go down or a certain machine um, were to go down, what would be the impact of that on the organization? And uh, we have some great uh, customer stories. We have uh, the Royal uh, Dutch uh, Weather Service here talking about how they're using uh, graph databases to Im analyze the impact of uh, their infrastructure or anything happening to their infrastructure. And um, the, we also have uh, Orange uh, from France, and they're also going to talk about their implementation of graph databases to solve the network and IT operations problem. The third use case, now we're getting a little bit more specific, and this is in the area of fraud. Now, fraud plagues many industries, whether you're in financial services, which is the most obvious one, but also insurance, even healthcare. And uh, organizations over the years have, have uh, continually combated fraud with new algorithms and new applications. And uh, fraud, as you can imagine, ends up costing organizations real money, and so it's a very a high priority for most organizations to figure out how they can effectively combat fraud. Traditional applications, fraud detection applications, have existed for a long time, and traditional applications look for outliers, you know, behaviors that are not within the normal usage pattern. If you're a credit card customer and all of a sudden you have a transaction that exceeds your monthly spend, immediately that gets flagged as fraud. Now, that's what we call traditional methods relying on discrete data. And that's certainly a very valuable way of uh, monitoring fraud. But uh, what's happening is that there is an increasing amount of sophistication demonstrated by fraudsters to kind of lie low and under the radar and uh, collude to create fraud rings that become very difficult to detect because their behavior is within the normal uh, bounds. And uh, however, if you look at the behavior at an aggregate as the ring, then you can detect fraud. And it's not just fraud. And you can apply that to crime or money laundering as well. That's where if you had the ability to detect those rings, to detect those relationships, and identify that it's not just an individual committing fraud, but it's a team committing fraud together, then you have uh, the ability to not only detect it, but prevent it in real time. Because as soon as every transaction happens, you can query your graph infrastructure to see, for this particular transaction, show me what are the other transactions and the relationships uh, from that individual to the other individuals committing those transactions. And that's where we're finding uh, graph databases augmenting your fraud detection solutions that today rely on discrete uh, uh, data as, as the basic source for analysis. Moving on, inside the organization, that's what we talked about. We talked about master data, we talked about fraud, and we talked about uh, your IT infrastructure. Now, outside the, uh, our customer-facing applications, Naimal talked about uh, real-time recommendations. Now, more and more business businesses are moving online. If you're, if you're in the retail business, uh, even if uh, you have the largest number of stores, uh, it is a true, you know, it is almost inevitable that over time a large portion of your business is going to move online. And the dynamics of online transactions or online retail are very different from the store. You don't have the ability to display all your products and exhibit a lot of uh, uh, sophistication in how you stack your products. And uh, what, what, do you, what do you do then? Well, that's where 
organizations are realizing that if they can learn more about the buyer and the behavior of the buyer and not as a buyer just uh, in isolation, but as a group of individuals who have common attributes, then they are able to make the right recommendations. Um, we can apply that the same thing to media and broadcasting. If you're selling content or if you're selling movies, uh, it's the same problem. And we also see that within logistics, where if you have a logistics network or a supply chain network and you want to optimize or if you want to drive efficiencies within that network, then uh, graph databases end up being the, the right uh, product because they are able to model the data and capture the data relationships and the model gets richer and richer with every transaction and every attribute that you collect. Emil mentioned that uh, four out of uh, 10 top retailers in the world are today using Neo4j as their infrastructure for making real-time recommendations. And that, that's very compelling evidence that this technology is uh, and how it, it helps with real-time recommendations. Graph-based search, we are going to uh, see a presentation by Sentin today where uh, they have, um, what they've done is they have a content management system that learns. It's a machine learning system that then enables search and discovery of content in the most efficient <coughs> fashion. Now this is again a problem that has been solved over the years in a search. There are a lot of uh, products out there that do searches, but traditionally, as with AltaVista, it's a keyword search. And now organizations are moving to a point where how can you disambiguate a query? How can you predict what the user is asking for? And a lot of that information is within the structure of the data. If you know a particular, um, for a particular user, if you know what their likes and dislikes are, then when a person searches for that user, you can show additional pieces of information that may not have been asked in the initial question. And that's what makes it more efficient, makes it more intelligent. Uh, it's a great presentation by Sentian. Uh, by the way, with the recommendations, uh, I forgot to mention that Adidas is here, and they have, you know, they have brought together the product and their digital content and the user profiles to make the right recommendations when you go on their uh, digital uh, portal. And that's uh, a great example of making real-time recommendations. Um, the final use case that we're finding uh, adoption of graph databases is this underlying infrastructure that's pretty much under every application, which is your identity and access management. And uh, you know, identity and access management is now being rethought. Because over time, over the years, it was seen as a very static function, you know, you, how you create new users or you modify their permissions and you delete users. And uh, you know, that was the role of the identity and access management system. But now, with the pace with which this happens, where your lines are getting blurred, your applications are also for your employees and customers, that it becomes very hard if you have not thought through the infrastructure and the speed with which you can manage these, uh, these changes. And so uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, usage of graph databases to manage identities and access uh, to products and services through those identities. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we don't have any, a customer presenting here, but we have uh, uh, our partners uh, talking to us about how they have uh, implemented identity and access management solutions. So I'd encourage you to see that uh, example as well. Uh, so once again, some common use cases for graphs. We see graph adoption both uh, within internal applications as well as customer-facing applications. And uh, you know, today we, we have truly brought together practitioners, we brought together engineers, our you know, folks who are experts in uh, specific use cases. And so if any of these uh, resonate or if you have additional use cases that don't appear here, uh, please feel free to, to reach out to our partners, to the Graph Clinic uh, folks, and, and discuss uh, how you can bring Graph databases within your organization. And with that, uh, we will break. Thank you very much, and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes.